So you replaced you replaced Gar. Yeah. And and how did that come about? Because I mean, that lineup was amazing. Awesome. You know. That was a great time. Um, sad to say, he was messing up on a lot of dope. But when you say he messed it up, do you mean like it, it affected his performance? Yes, his performance a lot, man. There was a lot of times where he looked back at me because I was his tap. <laughs> he looked back at me and said, I can't finish the gig, man. Really? <laughs> yeah. But How long were the gigs back then? Like an hour 15 or? About that, right? Yeah. Well, well that's not really too long. Yeah, I mean, they, they I mean, didn't play that. They did 45 minutes sometimes, too. Right. You know, it's about all that guy was now, did, did you meet them when they played here at the Token? No, it was Blondies. Awesome. Blondies. And they didn't have their drum tech quick. Right. They pulled the truck up and walked out to the kids. Why? Dave, I guess. Dave, I don't know. I don't know. Uh -huh. but they, and you were, you were, just, were you one of the opening bands or were you just hanging? No, I had been in a band called Massacre that opened for them the year before. Okay. And at Blondies as well? Blondies, right. Wow. And Dave remembered me, I guess. And uh, anyway, they didn't have anybody to set up the drums or anything. They had one rotor, and he was swamped, man. He was in hell. And so I set the guys drums up. And uh, they were like, you want a gig? You want a job? <laughs> now, back then, I mean, was it a paying gig? Or was it just kind of like come, you know, tour with us or uh, basically party? Oh, it was a tour with us. They paid me, I think, 300 bucks. 300 bucks a week and then 50 or no, 25 dollars a day per deal. That's not bad. That's not, that's not bad by today's standards. Yeah, that's good. I mean, I ended up then it ended up being like 600 dollars a week when we did like we started the Alice Cooper tour and that's where Gar got kicked out. Okay. And then they asked me to join. Them. And that was still during P Cell's yeah. time. This is before the album was even so was, far so good was even written. Yeah, it was before. I mean, when I first went out with it, it was before or right when P Cell's came. Out. Really? <laughs> that's crazy that they're still playing Blondies. I mean, yeah. I mean that's, that's a pretty small hall. Yeah, they did a lot of small places. Even, uh, even when we did the So Far So Good So What Show, we did a bunch of clubs. Yeah, like right at the beginning. Because right. I have a couple of bootlegs even before the Essen one of like one of your first like debuting Mary Jane for the first time and, really? and things like that. Yeah, you have to dig them up. They're, the quality's not... Not the Essence yeah, show, but... You see that so far, so, so high, so hidden, or whatever, you see that? Yeah. Is that the one, well, the oh, one I guess. had had a big picture of Dave, and it, it said Dave Comstain on it in the yeah. front, the very beginning. <laughs> I never saw that one. Okay, that's how it started out. That's funny. <laughs> it was pretty funny. It was a great show. Miss, can we get another ashtray, please? Another ashtray? Oh, yeah, ashtray? Oh, yeah sure. Appreciate it. I'll let you guys take care of business here. So that's good. So it's working, right? I did, I did an interview back in the day with Prong. Was it Troy? Was Troy in the band? No. Uh, no. Troy Gregory? No, no, this is after. This is, that's big to differ, right? I got, I got Troy and Dr. Magenta. Yeah. Jason left Metallica, Troy, and was, he and Troy the jam. Where? Like, just for fun? Just for fun, yeah. Out in L.A.? And, no, we had been jam when I lived. I still live here. Oh, okay. And, uh... I hadn't seen him in like, yeah, when I joined Megadeth, I hadn't seen him about eight months. And he called me and he was like, hey, what are you doing? He tried out for Metallica and Troy did too. How did, he, how did he have the connections? I mean, was it... He, he, the guys in Seduce, Seduce's manager at the time, was working for our agency too. It was, uh... <laughs> anyway, he was, he was Seduce's manager. And he was kind of like our gopher for our management company. And so Troy knew him, and that's how he went to call him. So he called me up just to see if there was anything that I knew of. And I'm like, yeah, lots of adjustments. I put the two together on, online. And got I didn't know that, that Troy replaced Jason. I mean, I knew that Troy yeah. was in prong. Was he on No Place for Disgrace? I just tell you the truth, I'm not sure what's up. But yeah, he that was a kick-ass record. For, uh, I think two records, and then it was prong. No shit. Yep. It's, it's, it's amazing. Do you still talk to Troy? Because he's in a garage rock band. It has been for a while. Are you kidding, bro? Yeah, they're called the Witch. Last time I knew they were called the Witches. I haven't seen them in years. I mean, they like play the Logger House and you know they're part of the garage rock indie scene. And whatnot. Really? Yeah, which is a big oh, change. You know, big yeah. 180. Yeah. And that's like doing the dosey dose. Oh, it's been around to me. <laughs> yeah. 
We'll get to that. Um, well, that's that. That's that's a cool piece of trivia. Um, so I'm trying to figure out. So you, you had gotten on the road. Now I want to know is when you guys were touring for Peace Cells, and, uh, were the shows? Tell me about the turnout. I mean, were there times that you guys played in front of 25 people? Was it pretty consistently like hundreds? It was consistently packed, but they weren't big places. They were like 500 to 700, maybe a thousand. Places like Arcos. Right. For the most part. That that's was, that's pretty then, big, though. I yeah, mean, I think. And they were packed. I mean, they were they were packed. Yeah, I mean, Megan, Megan, we did the Alice Cooper tour, we just say, and a lot of our, a lot of Megadeth people were there, they were some Megadeth people, you know, they were there, and then Dio, the same thing, when I joined the band, we went out with Dio, right when, right when I joined the band, and they were holding up banners saying Megadeth and Dio, and Sabotage, and you know, we all sold Megadeth merchandise. Oh, I believe it, I mean, at the time, there's no question that Megadeth was one of the most dangerous, real bands time. I mean, if you were in the Megadeth, that was like what the hard-ass kids at school listened to, you know? Kind of the troublemakers and whatnot, you know? <laughs> yeah. It was, I mean, that's the way it was back then, which has changed quite a bit. Now, so you, were, you had a lot of time to hang out with Chris Poland then. Yeah, I mean, man, Chris was a great guy. I mean, insane solos. Played very strangely, too, all the way, like, had his didn't play back here, he played like right next to his left hand. He's actually got a broken finger, and it, like, it's kind of bent, and it actually, he can do like a nine fret, maybe even bigger stretch because of that. Really? <laughs> it's a trip, man. He loved, he liked a lot of jazz, we listened to like on the road, we listened to, even when I was a roadie, we listened to a lot of Alan Holesworth, and mm -hmm. John Lewis Pony stuff, and uh, you know, IOU. I don't know about IOU, but definitely it's Alan Holdsworth. Bill Bruford and Holdsworth, the same band. Um, McLaughlin. So that's really cool. Now, did the whole band, like, when you were touring, were you guys all in a van, or did you have a couple separate trucks? Or? We had a bus. We had Johnny Cash's old bus, the first tour I did. The very first tour, I got picked up in we Winnebago's. Okay. And after that, we had a big, big beat up old bus. Now, did Dave Ellison and, and uh, Mustaine appreciate the, you know, like the fusion jazz as well, or? Dave Ellison did a little, did Mustaine really didn't listen to it that much. I mean, he said he liked it, but I never, you know, he never put it on. Right. You know what I'm At the time, was he... He liked a lot of beer, you know, punk stuff. Yeah, a lot of older, fa faster punk stuff, huh? Yeah, that's, that was my impression of him, I didn't know. I mean, it definitely comes out in his playing, I mean, some damn good fast riffs, you know? Yeah. Did, now, did uh, when you guys were on the road, did you guys like like play your instruments and like practice a lot and like jam and try to write, or was it just kind of like the songs are written, you're on business, you're here to go on tour, and that's about the extent of it? A little, little of both. Um, depending on how, like, how many nights we played in the world, every once in a while we'd, we'd like do an extra long sound check and go over stuff like for a rest of peace or whatever, but. On the road, we had a little corner studio too that we could write stuff in the back of the bus. Did uh, you guys do that much, or? Not a lot. We, we could have used it a lot more than we did. But. Now, you had the, at the time, I mean, the three big bands, or there's a couple, I mean, you, you got Anthrax, Slayer, Metallica, Megadeth, pretty much. Testament too. Did you hang out with those guys a lot? I hung out a lot with Metallica. I hung out Lars real well. I didn't go too well with Dave, but. <laughs> I can see that. I mean, was that typically in, in L.A.? Yeah. When they were recording the Black Album, me and Lars, every Thursday night, we'd go to the, uh, I think it was Bordello's, it was called. It was the same building as uh, the Cat House, but they had, they usually have uh, one building, it's a different club name every night. So that's yeah. how they do it in L.A. So every Thursday night, we'd go to Bordello's. It's kind of like a ritual thing, and claim what they had recorded. I don't know how Dave took that. That was wrong when I left it. Right. Now, um, so you guys, so you finished the tour. What I'm curious about is how the writing process came about for So Far, So Good, So What? Uh, Dave had written, he had written most of the riffs, you know, already. I mean, he had a lot of it, you know, when I was, when I was a drum tech. And so basically what we did was put a lot of that together. And put a lot so of did he come in with quick. with individual riffs? Or did he basically have it arranged and laid out? It wasn't, they weren't all totally arranged. They were arranged differently. We changed things around. We 
we only had about a month before we went to the studio when I joined the band. So, did he have... I was supposed to get out of college, actually. Really? Yeah. That's awesome. Wow, I, I like, like that. My drums came in the day before we went to the studio. So I only had one rehearsal on drums. No shit. Yeah. It was nightmare for me. I it, pulled it off. Yeah, that, yeah, that seems pretty hectic. Um, Pretty, pretty fast space. Did he, did he, did he have the words already written or? A lot, a lot of it, but I mean, Dave likes to write in the studio, which is good for the creative element, but it's bad for how much money you're spending. Absolutely, I can imagine that. <laughs> but when we did the So Far album, we had like, I think it was a little more than a quarter million budget. So. Well, that's quite a bit. Or he sells was only seven thousand. Okay. And I think the first album was only like three or four grand they had. Yeah. It sounds like it, unfortunately, because yeah, Killing is My Business is a great album, but the production is really... I know. I wish we'd have done, redone some of those songs. Even the remix isn't that great. You know? No. Uh, it's just, I mean, I don't know what you can do with that tone they got in those guitars. I don't, I don't know where they went. Oh, my <laughs> God. Yeah. <laughs> he actually he actually got a good tone on uh well P sells as good tone as well. Yeah. But on so far so good he actually had a nice thick tone. Yeah, they had some time finally, you know. I mean I, I had three weeks to do the drum tracks and I'm so used to recording and we have no money, you know what I'm saying? Like we, we used to record out in the schoolhouse in Ann Arbor. Mm -hmm. With and, Pete uh, Banker? With Pete. All right? Yep. And uh that's a trip, you know, Pete. We, I recorded with Pete. Anyway, uh, you know, we only had one day to do everything. Mm -hmm. So I was used to that. So I did all my drum tracks in like three, four days. Saved them like $100,000 just being a time to go pump them up. Yeah, I saved a lot more time to work on it. That's good, that's good. Did you work to a click track at the time? I did. Sometimes, I mean, I, I wrote, we had the human feel one where I, you know, sped up and slowed down a little bit different parts of the song. Uh -huh. but what songs were, were those? To tell you the truth, I don't remember exactly which ones I used it on. A lot of times I'd tell them that I heard it, but I didn't use it because I didn't want to use it. You know what I'm so sometimes I used it, sometimes I didn't. That's cool. I'm trying, I got a little. Uh, I'm trying, I'm trying to think. One to get into the recording. How, so how many hours at a time would, would you uh, guys rehearse? When you're writing this stuff. What that someone's apartment, I assume. Uh, yeah, it was Dave's apartment. Um, two, three. No, just two, three hours at a, at a time. Was it pretty much every day, or was it like every day? Before recording, all we had, before we went on the tour, we rented out this place called Nate's in North Hollywood. It's a big rehearsal studio. We did a lot of it before the tour. But the, but the writing itself was like yeah, pretty much. Much. Yes. To tell you the truth, I don't know how long Dave worked on the song before I came in, but when we were putting them all together, we did it all in less than a month. That's awesome. Now, now, there's been a lot of different rumors of how Jeff Young really came into the band. According to Dave, he had a different guitar player, and then it turns out this guitar player had a teacher being Jeff, and then they're like, well, let's just get Jeff then. Why screw her around? Have you ever heard of a band called Malice? No. They were, they were like a Judas Priest copy band, the guitar player was Jay Reynolds. J.K. Downey looked like everything. He was a friend of Junior's bass And we had him in the band for two or three months, actually. And he was such a good talker and a good, you know, bullshitter that uh, when we got him into the studio, he did his, made his first lead down and Dave fired him on the spot. Yeah, you know? it was really just not up to the caliber. So, so then he asked Dave for another chance when he brought this Jeff guy in. Teaching. Yeah, I was like, gee, I did that guy. <laughs> you know, that's what we did. Well, yeah, there's no question. Jeff Young was a just astonishing guitar player. Um, yeah, I mean, the solo on Hook and Mouth, that riff slash solo on Hook and Mouth. Flight just, of the Bumblebee. Yeah, I mean, now how was, I noticed, I noticed quite a bit that, you know, say on Arsenal and Megadeth when you guys are, are interviewing, um, he definitely seems quite a bit different than you guys. I mean, was that pretty much how it was? Yeah. He was, you know, like an L.A. Valley dude. You know, I'm trying to, you know, understand, but, um, did, it, did that cause just a, a lot of problems? Like, did you guys, when you guys were hanging out? Not really. We, we all got along pretty good. He wasn't, he wasn't too much of a 
there was no stuck up proceeding at times. I mean, like, in Europe, you ordered seven bottles of heavy on to wash his hair. The water was too hard. <laughs> that's pretty hilarious. That kind of shit, you know? That, 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 that. That's great, man. Right, right, right. Oh. <laughs> did, now, did you guys hang out as, as, a, as a group a lot, or was it pretty much you guys in a band, leave rehearsal, go do your own thing? Uh, I hung out with Dave. Uh, I had a lot of friends out there too. Like I said, I don't know a lot of different bands um, God, it's a long time. <laughs> now, when you guys were looking for I something, had a hot to, too, so. right? Yeah. Uh, right on. Uh, did you guys go see a lot of shows? Is that like the thing to do? We did. We saw. I mean, we go see Martin Crew and Guns N' Roses. When you, when you went to go see those shows, was it kind of like you guys were huddled in backstage area because you're kind of like celebs, or was it hanging? Okay. Well, we went out around anyway, but yeah, we went out of the backstage. I mean, I've heard that could be a whole different can of worms. I mean, from watching the Decline of Western Civilization movie, was it, was that time in L.A. really like basically the pinnacle of heavy metal? It was, yeah. Yeah. It was the rock scene and all those bands were all those fireworks popping like that. And most of the speed metal went to San Francisco. That's really metallic. It was tough being in L.A. in Hollywood. It's Slayer was there, weren't they? Yeah. But, I mean, most of the time we, we toured. We weren't there. Yeah, yeah. I, we got out. You guys were pretty busy, I can imagine. I mean, it's everyone's agenda. Now, how was it feeling at the time being a part of... You know, the, the band that's the absolute pinnacle of the thrash movement, and also, also, I mean, not just like a successful band. I mean, the Nickelback's a success, very successful band. That's great, right? But I'm talking more, you kind of guys had a credibility, but what I perceive would imagine be a credibility, because you, you guys have played some pretty dangerous music and, and attracted a pretty insane mentality of the fan. Perkins, Pe Perkins Palace and they took the fire extinguisher out and sprayed the board down and they had to stop the show and get a new board. Yeah. <laughs> they had to bring another board in. It took like a 45 minute break. Well, I can imagine. Luckily, Perfect luckily you weren't out in the middle of uh, Iowa, you know. I mean, that would have been the end of the show. Yeah, ripped out the first 10 rows of seats and shit like that. <laughs> you know, so. You had, a, you had the opportunity to, um, tour with a lot of bands. Who, who were the coolest bands that you, you toured with it, really? Alice Cooper was really cool. Uh, Iron Maiden, really cool. Who else? Dio, I was really good friends with Jimmy Bain. Me and him got along really good with the bass player. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, it was cool. Now, you guys toured with a lot of, uh, like, and you're talking about Alice Cooper and and, and Dia, who at the time were what I would imagine to be probably sold more tickets for like bigger in the eyes of the magazines than you maybe. Yeah. Do you guys ever feel like you were getting pushed around and like getting treated like the opening band? Iron Maiden wasn't like that at all. Dia, well like I said with Dia, um, we were out selling them. So they, they got kind of mad about that. I mean, like, but I think our, our light man and their light man had a little thing going. <laughs> well, like a war? Oh. <laughs> All of a sudden, we started getting more stuff, more lights, more stage and stuff like that. So, whatever they had to do, you know? Yeah, whatever, whatever works. So, that was that. But. How long were you actually a part of the band? Just under three years. Three years? 80, 87 to the very beginning of 90 or so. Mm-hmm. Chris was saying that you had some some pretty outstanding like uh, gig stories. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you want, well, we can take a break if you want. If you're yeah, starving. Let's do that. I use uh, rock moves. Well, rock man effects. <laughs> yes, yeah, his, his his tone was was pretty troubling. And then he fixed it for a little bit, and then he went back to straight trouble. Oh, I mean, is he? I don't know. I wonder if his ears are shot or something. It's kind of like Ted Nugent, man. If you listen to uh, 
Oh God, he has like sister, not sweet sister, but my Melissa, little Miss Dangerous. No, oh my God. It sounds like a crate with a little boss chorus pedal. I mean, it sounds God awful, man. I mean, it's horrible sound. It's like, what's going on here? I mean, that was the thing you were talking about, the, re the remixes. That's, he ruined his guitar tone, man. He just, I guess he just, probably from listening to all that punk, that's yeah. just in his, in his ears, you know, that. That's what he loved that song. He loved listening to Fear. He did that project with Lee Bing, didn't he? Yeah, B45 or yeah, something. Yeah. That was all right. Had bad guitar tone on that, too. It wasn't that good either. I, didn't, I never The CD it. was okay. Some of the songs were cool. It was just that dry, weak, no balls guitar tone, man. Yeah. I just don't, I don't get it, man. I don't get it. They lost it after Rust in Peace. It's, in my opinion, every single album from then on, even their biggest album, Countdown to Extinction, I thought the tone was yeah, just like got off. Yeah, Rust in Peace was a good record. Yeah, Rust in Free Peace was, was man, that was great. Yeah. I mean, I consider Megadeth as three records. His Peace sells so far so good in Rust in Peace. That's all that counts. That's what I was pissed off about, too. On Rust in Peace, I wrote like five of those songs with Dave Musically, in his life. And I got no credit at all. I mean, I even had to, uh, if we were to ask I had my publishing company and everything. Never signed off on it. That's why I was pissed. That's one of the main reasons I left. Really? I mean, I have a demo somewhere of me doing that whole album. And incidentally, Nick does it chop for chop. From somewhere. Oh, that's great, you know. Yeah. Nick was a good drummer. Oh, Nick Menzies, yeah. I mean, a little sterile, but other than that, it was good. Yeah, good beat. What does what? sterile mean? The drum machine? The drum machine didn't have much feel. You know what I mean? It was just straight, straight forward. I got to try to get a groove in there somewhere. But he always had a great drum mix, so I was jealous of that. Yeah, they probably got even more money to record with at that point. Oh, yeah. I mean, they were, they were as far as thrash metal bands, and they still wanted to be a thrash metal band. They were pretty much on top of the game. I, mean, I saw the Clash of the Titans too, right? Like I, when I saw you at the Palace, I saw them with, with Judas Priest. I saw they came back with Suicidal Tendencies, saw that show at the Palace. It was awesome. It was, it was on for sure. Yeah, Marty really had a lot to do with their, that too, man. Marty knew how to produce really well. Dave went to recording school. Really? And learned a lot of stuff. I mean, another thing that used to piss me off was that he didn't get producing credit. And all he did was, he says a joke about Paul Lanny lying on the couch and him doing all the work, and it's the other way around. Dave used to lie on the couch. <laughs> well, yeah, it sounds good. Yeah, producing credit. It pissed me off. And I'd be in there piecing vocals together. Like, a lot of the songs, excuse me, <laughs> you couldn't understand a fucking thing he said. Really? And we have to piece things together, not only as a harmonizer for, for the tone, but we have to piece, like he's through 16 tracks worth of vocals, the same vocals, and we piece like individual tracks words, tracks, like, sil down to the syllables sometimes, dude, I swear to God. That, that guy, that's crazy, that blows me away. And then we did that with solos, too, like the solo on In My Darkest Hour. Um, is it the one on In My Darkest Hour? I can't remember which solo it was, but... A lot of times we piece the solos together too, and then you have to relearn. Because <laughs> you know, they were written in the studio. Yeah, written in the studio. It was just like improv and you take the best. Take the best and put them together. Yeah. A couple measures of this one, a couple measures of that one, half a measure of this and that. And you know, with the digital, you can fly those guitars and punch them. You know. Mm -hmm. But he didn't do a lot of that. What was Elson's role? What was Elson's role in the band, really? He's kind of the happy, little, the lucky guy, you know. Um, he was like, if Dave would go off the deep end, he'd bring it back. You know, you know what I mean? Kind of like babysitting. <laughs> and me and him got along really good. I mean, Junior was easy to go. call him Junior those two days. But, uh, yeah, he seems that way. The funny thing is, actually, of all the guys that has the most of an L.A. accent, 
I'd say it's uh, Dave Ellison. That's probably he's from Minnesota. All right. <laughs> but the way he talks, you know, like that particular interview on Arsenal, Megadeth, and whatnot. I mean, it's it's pure. Well, I'm not pure LA guy. I mean, it could be a little more exaggerated. It wasn't Spicoli or something. No, he's a PR, PR guy though. He was good. Yeah, I guess you're right. Yeah. <laughs> what was your favorite uh like live performance? <laughs> Donington. Was that Monsters of Rock? Or? Monsters of Rock. We played with Iron Maiden and Kiss. Was Guns N' Roses? Yeah. But your kids died in that show. It's kind of sad. Because it was that, you know, they're all crammed up to the front. It was during Guns N' Roses. Oh. And that Sweet Child of Mine video? Mm hmm. Lars was there too. You can see in that video me and Lars standing on the side of the stage. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I never <laughs> noticed that. Just the lead. What 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 uh, shirt you have on? Zildjian. Oh. oh. I got to see it. I got a Zildjian shirt. Me and Lars are standing right next to me. Oh, that's funny. That must have been a trip hanging out with Guns N' Roses as well. Like when oh, right when they're right on the cusp. Yeah. I knew I knew Slash real well. Right. His name is Saul. I mean, were the guys just getting just wasted? Was that pretty much the agenda? He didn't get as drunk though as everybody thought he did. He was kind of smart. I mean, that was his image. But he wasn't always that fucked up. You know, that slash? Yeah. yeah, we've always wondered about that because... No, I asked him on the other hand. <laughs> I didn't hang out with him too much. I mean, he was just a dick. Yeah, just I'll always. Say, I'll always say that. He's an asshole. Asshole world was true. And he was, man. Just, just super arrogant to the extreme. Well, this is how we got the Iron. I'll, I'll give you one good story. This is how we got the Iron Maiden tour early. Iron Maiden, their tour, they ran at like, the tightest ship in rock and roll, man. You had to have a pass to take a ship, all right? You had to have your meal ticket. You didn't have a meal ticket. You didn't eat, right? They had all these old ladies for the catering company. And these old ladies would cook their ass off, right? But there was a certain amount of food the crew, the local crew, the bands, you know, and you had to have a ticket, so, you know, so they wouldn't waste it. I guess Axel lost his ticket or whatever. So he comes in there and he's like, uh, he wants his dinner, and the old lady's like, I can't give it to you if you don't have your ticket. And he's like, do you know who I am? And Axel Rose, you'll give me my dinner if I don't want it, blah, blah, blah. And she says, I don't care if you're Axel Rose or Jesus Christ, you ain't got a ticket, you ain't eat. Right. This little old lady, right? Fucking flipping tables over here. Fucked up everybody's fucking dinner. And they got immediately moved up to her. <coughs> That's the kind of shit that he did all the time. Mm -hmm. So we got the we got the enemy two or three months ago. Yeah, that's a, that's <laughs> they called right. us out of the blue and said, "Come on, I mean, we were, I was here. It was in June. I remember we were supposed to go out September. September. I was at my sister's graduation. <laughs> I got a call. Get on a plane. <laughs> we're, we're playing in Phoenix tomorrow. I was like, oh my god." <laughs> That was kind of cool. Yeah, that's really cool. I mean, I imagine Iron Maiden must have been one of your favorite bands. Yeah, they're cool. I mean, they're legends. Yeah. Yeah, I love playing with them. Nico was really cool. He's a great drummer. He's pretty hilarious. He's got some personality. Yeah, he does, man. He's always playing jokes. They'd always have like, a guy who played, he'd come out with one of them, like, high-powered electric squirt gun. <laughs> like on stage? Yeah, or? all the time. <laughs> he was always staring at my feet because he was a single bass player, you know. I used to do a fast double bass. And he would sit right behind me, <laughs> staring at me. You know, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. I believe it, I believe it. Chris was saying that at one particular show in, in Germany, you remember like just the, the crowd response was so huge. It was actually a physical force. Yeah. Oh, that was Monsters of Rock. Oh, that was, that was the oh. Donington show, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, when I got, I mean, I, you could see all the people, but when I got up on the stage... Yeah. Can I grab your bags or anything here? Ah, uh, gosh. Okay, another cool. Thank you very much. Just looking out at that, that audience, it was like, I mean, I almost fell back on my drum set. <laughs> and you know, I mean, you, you hold your hand up and the floor is barged. You know, it's like, whoa! 
How would you say, what time do you need to be back? Probably not. What time? 5.45. I got about 10 minutes. All right, cool. We'll, we'll wrap this up pretty quick here. Cool. Get some shit. See what I, what I have to work with. Now, I, talk to me a little bit about doing the Decline of Western Civilization movie. Is that pretty fun, or was yeah. it just another day, just like... No, Penelope Spears loves... I mean, first of all, she's a great, you know, movie director. You know, she's done a lot of big movies to start I didn't even really know that at the time. I met her. She'd come to a lot of our shows, you know. And uh, she was actually she was like a fan of metal too. She's a total fan of the band. I mean, in the arsenal, she says that, you know. I mean, it's her favorite band. She says that like she introduces uh, the 1988 part of the arsenal. Uh, anyway, is uh, it a hidden track? I don't remember that part being on there. Well, yeah, right before right before the In My Darkest Hour video, which she filmed. I must have like an edited version because it just goes right into do 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 on the version that I got it's she introduces that. She like introduces the decline part. Oh, I'll have to play that for Um anyway, she was kinda like mom, you know. She come to a lot of the shows and stuff. I never I never knew how how uh, big she was. You know, she did the first metal years, the punk mm -hmm. not the metal years, the decline. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, uh it was really cool, man. You know, she was, you know, none of us have really been in a movie before. It was the whole deal. You know? I was just bummed out it wasn't the whole song, you know? It's kind of, a, it's edited down a little bit. Well, in the movie it's not. I, I remember it being the same way. The video is. The video they edited it for uh, MTV. But I got the, I got a clip of the movie. And the movie's the whole thing. Hmm. Really? I mean, that's how I remembered. I, I've got the movie maybe as well, but I haven't maybe, maybe watched it right. in a while. I just remember, you know, like, just the final, well, what was the part? Remember? Is it just like one of the, the final jamming sections? Yeah, they cut, they cut, like, some day. Yeah, that's right. And then they cut the uh, slow part. Like, you're right. I think you're right. I, I, I can't I can't get into the specifics too much. Now Seduce was in it too. Did you when they were yeah. in? Did you guys were you guys hanging out? I told you out? our manager was was uh or their manager worked for our management company. So yeah, we got them in the movie. It was pretty cool. And they came out and did a couple of shows too in uh, Pasadena and a couple other places. Well, there's yeah. a couple of hilarious characters in that movie. I mean Chris Holmes. Well, Chris Holmes is he's a, star a good, of he's it. a good buddy of mine, man. Fucking he'd come over all the time. He'd, one of them dudes where he'd slap you in the back, hey, how you doing? Knock the wind out of you, you know? Didn't know his own strength. And he'd always be like, piss drunk, walking down Hollywood Boulevard at like two in the morning, he'd be driving, <laughs> there's Chris. Oh, I mean, dude, he was a character. He was, he, and I constantly, and my girlfriend was real good friends with Lita, with Lita Ford, so I heard nothing but her bitching about how Chris would do this and Chris would do that. Every time she'd come over to my house, Lita would come over to see my old lady. I'd, I'd go look for Chris because I knew he was in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Try to get him out of whatever trouble he was in. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's interesting to hear because a lot of people <coughs> on uh, Metal Sludge in particular were wondering if that kind of pool scene was staged or no, exaggerated or. A little bit, no. That's Chris, man. That's older. <laughs> yep. <laughs> What about like uh, Lizzie Borden? Was it, wasn't it Lizzie Borden did Born to Be Wild in the right in the beginning? <laughs> you know those guys at all? Or? Yeah. Uh, what about Rhodey's fist in his boots? <laughs> really? Was that at a show yeah, you guys were, did together? Or? Yeah, they were just a little corny, man. I don't know. And their drummer was really good. I don't know. Was Lizzie, the guy, that, the singer and the drummer were brothers. But. Yeah, they were, they were a little cornball. What about what about the? Uh, it wasn't Thor. It was Odin. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, we didn't like you know we didn't see all those when that was filmed. But, but I was just then, wondering maybe you knew of them because you're just in the area. We just hung out that the show in London too. I that Nader the Priest guy. Dude, that guy was showed up. At, I had a party for my birthday, and that guy showed up at my party, dude. He was like the local asshole. Oh, yeah. you know? Right. But, yeah, those were the days, dude. It was just nuts. Constantly nuts. And there was a lot of drugs, man. I mean, in that, in that, that time, it wasn't looked at as bad. You know what I mean? Because you're, you're not, it's not like junkies in the alley getting high. You know, everybody did. I mean, good management. If you did, brought in a lot of enough people, they'd buy you an eight ball. You know? So, 
Was that promoters at the club would do yeah, that? Yeah, promoters or your tour manager. I mean, we had a tour manager that would go That's like your bonus us, then? Yeah, you know. <laughs> How did they like on the road, it would keep you going, supposedly. But nowadays, it's totally different. You can't even get a deal if you fucked up. Right. So, which is good, man. I mean, a lot of people died, and I don't, you know. A lot of them. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's a bad thing. I mean, I've been clean for a long time now, but I tell you, Everybody, fucking everybody. Bobby, who ever shoot fucking Jack Daniels? <laughs> Come on. You know what I'm saying? How did the, now, you're talking about the management and the promoter and whatnot, but how did the record company look at uh, the lifestyle? They turned their head as long as you sold records, and the tour managers kept you going. You know, like that Pink Floyd tune, the little Pink Floyd tune, you need to show them that. They didn't care as long as you made money, you know? Yeah, yeah. We did like, do a lot of that for Capitol. We made them a lot of money. Yeah, because yeah, you were bringing up a point how uh, nowadays, if, if you know, they even know they have any sort of partying uh, lifestyle, they, a lot of people look down on it. And I've even heard rumors. I don't know that if they find out, you know, they're just not going to deal with you or consider you. They, won't. they really won't. Man. Because it's too much of a liability. You know, they, if you go big and then all of a sudden you're in the middle of a tour and somebody dies, they lose all of them. So. Well, cool. I'll tell you what, I'll wrap it up here. And